This is the American Law Journal. Bankruptcy, it's all about a clean slate, but there are some things you can never, ever, never discharge under Chapter 7. Or can you? Good evening, I'm Christopher Naughton. Welcome to ALJ, and if you're in over your head, bankruptcy might turn out to be your best friend. But the laws were written so that there are some things that you can never discharge, and that includes student loans. Gina Passarella with the Legal Intelligencer has this. My fiance and I uh, sat down recently. And we both graduated from law school. Uh, currently have about $225,000 in student loans. We went to a, uh, uh, to a, a private law school. We make right at about $80,000 combined income. So, so I'm confused. Guess, you went to law school to make $40,000 a year the rest of your life? <laughs> they didn't tell me that when I signed the line. But <laughs> if the notion of bankruptcy wasn't so important, the founders probably wouldn't have put it squarely in our Constitution. But if you're hoping bankruptcy will get rid of all of your debts, think again. The U.S. Bankruptcy Code has etched out some important exceptions. Owe taxes to Uncle Sam or your state? Chances are very good you will be paying them back even if you file Chapter 7. Owe your ex-spouse support money for her or the kids? Yep, bankruptcy won't discharge that debt either. And then there are student loans. In fact, delinquencies are rising on student loans even as they fall for most other types of debt. Student debt in the U.S. is now bigger than debt from credit cards and auto loans and is second only to mortgages. But people who owe money on credit cards, auto, or home loans can often renegotiate balances and interest rates, or at least discharge them under bankruptcy. The same can't be said for student loans. It is non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. They will garnish your wages. They will intercept your, your tax refunds. They, they, they will sue you in court. Which is why some in Congress are moving to change the laws. A student who's trying to get a loan to go to college will pay almost 7%. In other words, the federal government is going to charge interest rates nine times higher than the rates they charge the biggest banks, the same banks that destroyed millions of jobs and nearly broke the economy. That isn't right. And behind skyrocketing student debt may lie the real culprit, the astronomical rise in tuition costs over the last generation. For those graduating from public colleges and universities, state taxpayers, through their state legislatures, used to be more willing to fund higher education. And so increasingly, students and their families are paying for their higher education. Until Congress acts, student loan debt remains largely non-dischargeable under bankruptcy, meaning students and their lawyers will have to work harder to get them a pass. For the American Law Journal, I'm Gina Passarella. All right, three guests with me uh, weigh in tonight. Your phone calls and emails as well. Let's go ahead and meet my guest. George Lutz is a debtor's attorney of almost 30 years with Case, D.G. Ambrodino and Lutz. He represents individuals and businesses in Chapter 7, 11, and 13 matters. Mark Cooker has spent the better part of his career concentrating on mass torts, environmental law, and consumer cases. He has successfully represented consumers in three cases before his state Supreme Court in New Jersey marks a partner with the plaintiff's law firm of Williams Cooker Berezovsky in Philadelphia and Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And John Pearson joins our panel for the very first time tonight. Creditor's attorney with Ballard Spar. He's involved in all aspects of bankruptcy litigation and has appeared on an American Bankruptcy Institute panel on you can't discharge student loans in bankruptcy or can you? 1-800-426-4625, the number right here in our studios. If you are bashful, you can email us tonight at info at lawjournaltv.com, but do it early if you want to have your question answered. So let's take a quick look here. What is absolutely, quote unquote, non-dischargeable under Chapter 7 and the three that Gina talked about in the past in the, in the Gina's uh, package? Taxes and tax liens are not dischargeable. Alimony and child support and, of course, uh, student loans, which we're going to talk about. Some of the others, which we're not going to get into, read them at your leisure on the screen, deal mostly with fraud, or if you plow into somebody driving drunk one night, don't expect your bankruptcy judge to help you out there. Condominium or cooperative association fees, that sort of thing. I don't know who put that in the bill. But interestingly enough, I've got to think, George, that when people come to see you, are they really aware of the fact that there are some ironclad rules? You're coming to town with debt. You want to get rid of it under bankruptcy, but forget about it. Taxes, alimony, student loans, forget it. 
Well, I agree with you regarding alimony, child support, that sort of debt. Uh, taxes are dischargeable. Withholding taxes uh, are not, but income taxes are dischargeable if certain time limits are met. Uh, student loans, very difficult to discharge in a bankruptcy. It's not impossible. I wouldn't say you absolutely can't, but it, it's, it's a challenge to do that. Right. And alimony and support, impossible, right, John? That's correct. Right. Uh, and, and do people actually, you know, try to drive a stake or a wedge in there? I mean, is there an undue hardship argument that you can ever make with taxes or with child support? I know you can make it with student well, loans. Well, with, with income taxes, it's not an undue hardship standard. It's, there's a, a rule that uh, bankruptcy lawyers call the three-year, uh, two-year, 240-day rule. If the taxes are due more than three years uh, ago, for, for example, if a client came in to me today and had some 2011 income taxes that he uh, or she would like to be discharged, those taxes are due on April, were due on April 15th, 2012. Three years later is April 15th, 2015. We're not there yet. And so I would counsel that person to wait until next month after April 15th to file a case. If they meet that requirement, then they have to meet the two-year requirement, which means that if that return was filed late, it has to have been filed more than two years before the date you file the bankruptcy. And finally, there's a 240-day requirement. Uh, the IRS makes an internal notation on its records. It's called an assessment. That assessment must have been made more than 240 days before the date you filed the bankruptcy. But if you file the bankruptcy and meet mm -hmm. those three requirements, those income taxes will be dischargeable. And we've got an email actually on that very issue, and, I, and you may have already explained it, but this is uh, from George from Doylestown. I filed my 2011 tax form in April of 2012, and then I filed bankruptcy in September 2014. Would my 2011 taxes be dischargeable? No, because the 2011 taxes were due on April 15, 2012. Add three years. It's April 15, 2015. You filed before that date, and so those taxes are not dischargeable. Gotcha. All right, let's get to the cause celeb tonight, which is about student loan. Uh, student loans. I. I wasn't aware of this fact, but let's take a quick look at this graphic. Household debt in America, 40%, almost 40% of household debt are now student loan debts. In, in some ways, Mark Cooker, how did it get so high so fast? Well, I think one thing that happened was there was an explosion during the, during the credit boom. Um, during the credit boom and bust, there was an explosion in securitization and private student lending. Um, what securitization means is the lender, instead of having to worry about whether the borrower could actually pay back the loan, immediately turns around and sells the loan to Wall Street as a profit. That happened in the housing market. That happened in the student loan market. So private lo student loan debt doubled during that time. Another thing that happened was they were really borrowing, they were lending excessive amounts of money. Uh, the average private student loan during that period of time loaned 150 percent of tuition and fees combined. Wow. So they were lending a lot of money and because they were basically farming out these loans to Wall Street, they were not looking closely at the creditworthiness of the borrowers. So it was more money going to more people who had less ability to pay it back. So the, that at least is part of the problem. Gotcha. And, and the big question is, why do we treat student loans differently than, than I mean, again, credit cards, you're going to write that off. Auto loans, you get rid of the car. Mortgage, in some instances, George, we've discussed this, there has been discussion of uh, changing the balances, the rates, not often. You can get that. Student loans, no help here. I, I think my understanding of the history of the student loan non-dischargeability provision is that the, the reason it's non-dischargeable is because <clears throat> when an individual graduates from college and has $70,000 of student loan debt, at that point in their lives, they are likely not to have many assets and not to have much income. And I think that those who wrote the bankruptcy code felt that there'd be a lot of newly gradu graduated students filing for bankruptcy to get rid of student loan debt. The rule used to be that if the student loan debt was older than seven years, you can discharge it. That rule was gone in 2005. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I think that's the basis for making student loan debt so difficult to discharge. And yet, John, in 2005, uh, under BAPSIPA, again, which is the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act, which some of us feel neither prevents abuse or protects consumers, they didn't, they not only didn't give uh, students, throw them a bone, they made it harder for them. That's correct. They, uh, in 2005, they actually added another exception to the dischargeability of student loans, and that was with the private sector loans. Right. Okay. Now, uh, m most, most student loans are public or federal, federally backed loans. I mean, they may still come through a private institution, correct? But if they are federally backed, then they're considered federal loans. That, right. That, that is correct. Right. I would say that the statistics are about 85% of the loans are federally backed student loans. Okay. 
I would argue that though in 2010, there is no longer private institutions issuing out student loans that are federally backed. Uh, the federal government is doing that under the direct loan program. Okay, but for, from your perspective, from creditors' perspective, I mean, other than the fact that you know the banks would like to retain as much of their money as possible, why do you not see movement here from the banks and the lending institutions when we've actually seen some movement in some of these other areas? Well, there's a number of uh, competing interests, I would say, that the creditors have to deal with. Uh, one is the fact that you have, although the private student loan lenders are an easy target by politicians because they're the banks and they're not the federal government, these are very special loans in the sense that most of the time that the borrowers come to the table, they don't have a credit background. They're not necessarily credit worthy and that's what usually when you get a co-signer involved and it's usually a parent or some other guardian. Another aspect as to why you may not see as much movement as you would like is that, for example, the CFPB would like for the private lenders to do more repayment plans, whereas the bank regulators uh, make it quite difficult at times for them to do so because they have their own accounting and other regulatory issues that they have to do uh, to the federal government. Okay, uh, let me let me put up a quote here. Actually, Mark, I think you, you quoted this, uh, uh, this attorney at one point in time. <clears throat> Is the student loan crisis similar to the mortgage crisis of 2008? Professor Jennifer Taub in her book, Other People's Houses said, it was okay to short someone's house through credit derivatives, commit trillions of dollars to rescue the banking system and fail to prosecute the top bankers who facilitated the fraud, but not to help save other people's houses. If we just transcribe those last three words and said to save people who had taken out student loans instead of other people's houses, aren't we, Mark, talking about more or less the same thing? Well, there, there is a parallel. I mean, I mean, part of the parallel is that um, what Jennifer was talking about was there was a, a preference in the bankruptcy code that says you don't write down, you can't write down mortgage debt in bankruptcy. And the, that was kind of the central point of her book. In this situation, you have a lot of student loan, private student loan debt that was put out through using shoddy underwriting practices, farmed over to Wall Street. Okay. There was also, a, a, there's also. Which was least, like the mortgage crisis. Right, and there's also, a, there's another parallel with the mortgage crisis, which okay. is, it, when it comes to mortgages, there, there can be an unholy alliance between the builder and the lender. Uh, the builder can sell the home at a better price if he can arrange for easy financing. And I've had cases where the builder actually fraudulently qualifies the lender, the borrower, for the mortgage to buy the house, and then, of course, they can't pay for the house, and the builder walks off with a lot of money. Same thing has happened in higher education. There have been inappropriate relationships between the private lenders and the, even the uh, private universities that, and the not-for-profit universities, and has definitely been an indication that happens with the the for-profit institutions. And so you have an arguably overpriced education being sold in a bad loan, similar to a arguably overpriced house was sold during the mortgage bill. Okay, and we're gonna, we're gonna get to uh, your phone calls in just a minute, 1-800-426-4625. But let's quickly talk about something that Mark Cooker just raised, and that's this whole notion of for-profit colleges. Uh, these colleges make up, I think, 31% of the student loans that are out there, and yet only about 13 and, and yet only 13% of the students are, are uh, eligible for these loans. So there seems to be a disproportionate amount of money going to these for-profit colleges. And a lot of these for-profit college loans end up in default. Isn't that part of the, isn't that, not the genesis, but maybe a big factor in why we've got so, such a crisis with student loans today? Well, I, I think that's part of it. I think the for-profit colleges are not graduating their students and allowing them to get jobs that would allow them to repay the student loan. I mean, the, the social contract with student loans is the government, or in some cases, private lenders, help you go to college, you get graduate from college, you ha get a job that pays you enough money to repay the debt. That contract is premised on facts that don't exist for many people, and it doesn't exist primarily for graduates of the for-profit colleges because they're just not getting the jobs in this economy that allow them to service the debt. And from what I understand, John, they're actually there's, these schools are now undergoing some greater scrutiny since so many kids are defaulting here. That's correct. A number of these for-profit schools have actually closed down, and actually uh, one of the scrutiny is on the federal student loan lending side is to look at what they call the cohort default rate 
and it's a default rate over a three-year period of time, and if that rate exceeds whatever the standard may be for that particular uh, school, the federal government may pull the funds from actually uh, providing student loans there. Which is the death of the school. That's the end of right. it. They, got it. The, the concept of a student act just writing a check to pay tuition to support that school it's not going to happen. Not, not for them, not for the... Go ahead, Mark, we're going to get the phone yeah, calls. There's a, there's a third point as well. Uh, there's a, a law that says if the college has done something essentially to cheat you, to harm you financially or harm your education, you can have the whole student loan debt forgiven. And I know, like, for instance, there's a for-profit school called Corinthian College that went under. Uh, they were sued by attorneys general for lying about their job placement rates, lying about their graduation rates. Now there's a movement afoot, I think, to forgive about $480 million wow. in debt that people okay. incurred at trying to attend those colleges. Wow. Okay, let's get to your telephone calls. Lynn, you're up first tonight. You've got a question dealing with, I think, student loans that you've uh, taken out yourself. Yeah, um, actually, I, I have about 25000 in student loans. And over the four years that I was in college, my interest rate went up from 3% to 6%. Over this, and, and I know interest rates are even higher now. Over the same period of time, my mortgage, you know, mortgage interest rates dropped, and so I could refinance my home at a lower rate. And I just want to know why do interest rates on student loans only go up, and why don't isn't it ever offered that we can refinance for a better rate as our credit gets better, as where we make consistent payments for right. those of us that are actually following through with paying our student loans. Thanks. Let's forget forgiveness for a minute. Why not just bring their rates down? Well, bringing the rates down would would certainly help. But I, I think that, first of all, with respect to private loans, if you're credit worthy and can get a private loan, uh, to pay off a student loan, whether it's a private student loan or a federal student loan, then Lynn can do that. You know, if she, she, the question is not asking the existing lender. The, the idea is not to ask the existing lender to lower the rate. If you're credit worthy, go out and get a private loan at a lower rate and pay off the loans that you have. But the lender made a loan at a certain interest rate. That lender is it, it's in the business to make money. I don't think it's going to lower yeah, your federal, rate just because you ask. But again, but again, the federal government is backing these up, and well, so well, the, the, Senator the, Warren had actually proposed that that everybody could could basically get paid at the new rate. In other words, the current rate is 6%, the new rate is 3.86%. She proposed a law that would have everybody pay the new rate that, that was being offered on new loans, but that was uh, did not get through Congress. Right. You're surprised, Mark. I'm sure you're absolutely shocked that didn't get through Congress. A little, a, a little bit of tongue in cheek there, but uh, I guess we shouldn't. I mean, it, it's it's unfortunate to, to, and, and that, that's to also, think that, that didn't get passed. To be clear, I, I don't think that's going to be a, an overall solution of the issue. Uh, if you have a hundred thousand dollars of student loan debt, and you cut the interest rate from six point eight percent in half, okay, that's going in the right direction. But I'd be willing to bet a f large percentage of individuals with that kind of debt can't pay that, even the low, can't pay the lower monthly payment either. And what, what you really need to do is look at administrative remedies, non-bankruptcy remedies, especially, particularly if it's a federal loan, there are a lot of administrative remedies available and you should look into those. Right. <clears throat> but again, if they qualify for a loan, you're talking about taking out a private loan, they've already got debt, and I get it, it depends on what, what kind of equity they may have in their house and that sort of thing, but you're talking about a student whose student who's already got maybe in over their heads. No, but what I'm talking about is if you have federal student loans, there are administrative remedies available. There's, there's, there's forgiveness, there's public service forgiveness, teacher forgiveness, but even now there's, there's some new plans. There's a, what we call IBR, an income-based repayment plan. You could owe $200,000. It has nothing to do with what you owe. It has to do with your income, and there's a, a formula that they go through, and you may have a monthly payment that you can easily afford. Now, the bad part of that is that monthly payment continues for 20 or 25 years, and at that point, though, anything that's not paid is forgiven. They are very powerful, administrative, non-bankruptcy remedies that everyone with the crushing student loan debt should look into. Okay. And he said administrative. That means you do go to the government and asking for some help. That's right. This is That's not correct. private loans. Gotcha. That's correct. All right. Uh, you know, uh, we see plenty of commercials on television today, not just lawyer commercials or pharma commercials, which we're going to talk about in the upcoming weeks. We also see a lot of, you know, you know, 
realign your debt. Uh, make sure we can pay things off, whether it's a car, whether it's a credit card. I'm seeing these commercials all over the place now. Reduce your student loan debt. What about these? We've talked about you know groups who may go out and lend you some money if you're in over your head with your with your home. What about these kinds of groups, George and John? What do you think? I would say there's a number of these groups, and there's been a couple of proceedings by the CFPB because they do false advertisement as far as promising that they can lower your student loan payments or get you out of the student loan in its entirety. It said, one of those uh, co commercials just said discharge. And basically what, and that's obviously a misrepresentation in most instances, right. but the basic core to what they're offering as far as the services mm -hmm. is available online on all these administrative remedies that George was just talking about. Right, the Debar <clears throat> I, I agree. Uh, they, you know, you can get a private service provider to help you, you can get an attorney to help you. Theoretically, you can go on the Department of Education website. Uh, it's quite complex, but you need to get somebody uh, savvy in that area to help you. But what you need to be really careful of, particularly with these ads that we just saw, is some of them are offering to do what your caller Lynn suggested, or what I suggested to Lynn. Get private money, pay off a federal loan. Mm -hmm. That's almost always a bad thing because there are, as I said, when you have federal student loans, there are administrative avenues available possibly to discharge the debt. And if you change that federal loan to a private loan, those administrative remedies are not available to you. So you need to talk to somebody that knows what they're talking about. And there, there's, not, and there's a third ahead, piece too, if I can just interject. Go ahead, Mark. Um, a lot of these so-called credit repair organizations charge up upfront fees for their services. That's illegal. That violates federal law. It violates state law. So while they say they're going to try to get you out of debt, they ask for some money up front to start to restructure your debt. They right. can't do that. And we know with credit council uh, groups, uh, often they are, let's just say, they're shills for some of the credit card companies, their fronts, let's put it that way. Is, it, is the same, uh, same thing true here? I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me a bit if it's a bait and switch trying to get you to refinance debt at some inflated interest gotcha. rate. All right, let's see if we can get a, f a few more phone calls in before the half hour ends. If we don't get to them, we will st stay here in the studio for about 10 minutes thereafter and take some more of your phone calls. Uh, let's go to William in Sellersville next. William, what's your question for us? I, I have back taxes. Uh, I've been I've done my taxes since 2006, and they got me up for 66000 with interest and everything like that. And I'll file that for bankruptcy and then get out of it, or what I have to do? Well, if you wait until after this coming April 15th, then any taxes for tax year 2011 and earlier would be dischargeable if the tax returns that you filed were not misleading uh, and if filed late were filed more than two years ago. You should call a bankruptcy attorney. You're likely to get an answer to that question on the phone. He or she may have some further questions for you. but. A lot of people think that taxes just are not dischargeable in bankruptcy. That's not the case. And a lot about a lot about what the kind of work you do. It's not about bankruptcy. Sometimes this is about counseling. This is about finding other ways out of the problem without having to file a Chapter Seven or Thirteen. If you have a you know if you have a, a large tax debt, you can uh, talk to an attorney about an offer in compromise with the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, some people file a bankruptcy to get rid of credit card and medical debt so that better enables them to service the debt that doesn't go away, such as student loans and, and some taxes. So there's, there's various ways to approach it. Gotcha. And I, and I actually agree, and I think one of the main issues that we encounter on the creditor side is the fact that a lot of debtors' counsel do not understand, one, uh, the administrative remedies that George just talked about, and two, some of the uh, issues that come up for example, let's take a Chapter 13 case, and you propose a plan, and you're going to make certain payments on your student loan. Right. It's not dischargeable at the end of the three or five year term, but what happens oftentimes is the payments aren't in full, and the lender may take those payments and apply them to the post-petition interest, and when you get out of your bankruptcy plan and thought you got this discharge on all this other debt, you actually owe you know, as much, if not more, on the student loan after a three or five year period. Right, so we're, we're, there, there may be ways to find, if not forgive, forgiveness, then forbearance, right? Correct. Correct. Right. right, okay. Yeah, if you're in a Chapter 13 bankruptcy, which typically lasts five years, at the end of the bankruptcy, uh, the, the, tax, the student loan debt is still there, but while you're in the <clears throat> bankruptcy, the automatic stay does prohibit the lender, private or federal, from pursuing you for that debt. So some people go into a Chapter 13 just for the shelter, just to sort of hide out in a Chapter 13 so they can get their life together. 
but <clears throat> as uh, stated at the end, the, the debts are still there. Mark, what can we, what can be done here? I mean, again, again, you do consumer protection work. I don't know, uh, other than an act of Congress, uh, there's nothing that states really can do here. When are students going to get some relief here, some real relief? Well, I want, I want to talk a little bit, go back to when this law was changed in 2005 and originally, I think, in 1976. And there's a lot of urban legends about bankruptcy. And at the time this prohibition was put into effect, the actual rate of, of consumer uh, of bankruptcies and student loans was a fraction of 1%. The amount of consumer debt that was uncollectible due to bankruptcy was 3 to 4%, which is favorable to all the types of consumer credit. And so... When, and then when this law was amended in 2005 to extend this ban on discharge to private loans, it was really nothing but a giveaway to the private lenders. It did not result in lower interest rates. It did not result in greater access to credit. It was basically a free, run, free lunch for the private lenders. And as it turned out, Mark, it really didn't even help the credit card companies that much. In some ways, I don't know. <coughs> uh, we may have all been losers. That's another topic for another time. I want to thank my three guests tonight. George Lutz, again, from Case, D.G. Ambarodino and Lutz, representing debtors in over their head in Chapter 7, 11, and 13 matters. Mark Cooker joining us tonight from Williams Cooker Berezovsky, consumer protection attorney with that law firm, and John Pearson, creditor's attorney with Ballard Spar. And just a quick reminder, or actually a quick thank you to the American Bankruptcy Institute. We've got a little information about an upcoming webinar right after this. We're still taking your telephone calls right here in the studio, 1-800-426-4625. For all of us here at the American Law Journal, thanks for joining us this week. Until next Monday night, case closed. This week's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by Law Catalyst, legal media and marketing for lawyers. Go to lawcatalyst.com. Scheller PC, since 1977, its mission has focused on one thing, protect the rights of individuals harmed by others' negligence or corporate misconduct. Representing people injured by dangerous drugs, faulty products, and whistleblowers in False Claim Act and key TAM matters. Blank Rome, a national multi-practice firm for over 60 years, with more than 400 attorneys in six states in the District of Columbia. Blank Rome's highly regarded employment law practice provides representation and strategic strategic advice for critical issues facing employers in today's workplace. And the Legal Intelligencer, an American lawyer media company, and the oldest daily legal newspaper in the United States.